Welcome to Thank Teachers you. Teaching Teachers. It is show 352. It's uh, June June 5th, 2013. And uh, we are graced tonight with uh, James Paul G., who uh, published a book, I think it was in January, if I looked yes. at the publications correctly, um, called The um, Anti-Education Era. And the subtitle, which I said last week, or two weeks ago when we talked about the book, is, is even more provocative. And that subtitle, Chris Sloan, is... <laughs> uh, creating Smarter Students Through Digital Learning, is that subtitle. Right. So um, we've uh, prepped uh, Jim, um, and he's allowed us to call him Jim here tonight, mm -hmm. with, uh, with saying that we are a conversational show. We're not really interviewing him. Um, we want to talk about the book, and we want to give him lots of space to talk about what he'd like to talk about. Um, uh, but first, let's uh, just quickly go around and, and say introductions. Um, I'll start by saying that I'm a teacher in the Bronx and uh, an English teacher, and I just finished the book just a minute ago, <laughs> and um, racing to get done, um, but I but, um, really, really loved um, two parts of the book that I want to get to. That I, I want to hear more about the, I think it's called the circuit of human reflective action. That seems like a really important concept that gets expanded is, yeah. in different ways, and then from there, down to affinity spaces, uh, you know, good. those are sort of my two um, All right, good. places that I'd love to hear much more about. So, there we go. Uh, and why don't we start with Chris to introduce, just quick introductions. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach uh, high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I would also like to talk about the collective intelligence idea. I realize that wasn't part of my introduction, but I thought I'd float that out there anyway. Great. Jesse, welcome. This is your second time, I think, on TTT. But... Yep, second time. Welcome. Um, third time will be a charm. <laughs> um, I'm Jesse Stommel, and I'm the director of Hybrid Pedagogy, which is a, a journal, a digital journal of teaching and technology. And I'm also a college professor in Portland, Oregon. And I teach English, and I teach film. And there's, I actually have the same thing that I was literally reading the book right up until the seconds that this <laughs> conversation started. And I, I sort of have some stuff that I highlighted that I may, if the particular passages that I was drawn to are seem important to the conversation, I may throw some in. Good. Sounds good. Joel. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Maley, and I teach uh, English in, at a high school you know, outside of Buffalo, New York, called Chitawaga Central, and uh, I teach a couple of English classes there. But I'm also a writing project person, and we've been working exploring connected learning um, uh, that the digital media uh, hub has kind of defined these principles as connected learning. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about that, and um, I have not read the book. But I just finished the preface in the first chapter uh, via the Amazon, the free version via the, the go, Amazon. Okay. And uh, you know what? I, I just read a passage that I had underlined that totally reminded me of most of the things we're talking about with connected learning. Um, just a quick quote. And key, key to their good use is that they be subordinate, subordinated ways to ways of connecting humans for rich learning and that they serve as tools human learners own and operate and do not simply serve. So I thought that was an interesting little quote. I'd love to uh, you know, see where our, our, our conversation goes. Okay. Interesting. I just wanted to point out, you also do a lot of video work with your students or have in the past, right? Yes, you yes, I do. So, yep. so just to point out that Chris Sloan is a media teacher and Jesse, you said you do film too. I mean, you do film as well, which is interesting. But, so. Uh, Michelle, Good. first time Hi. on TTT, I think. Yeah, Welcome. first time. I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to join in. Um, I'm Michelle Hagerman, and I am a former middle and high school teacher. I actually taught French as a second language for um, about nine years in Canada before I went to Michigan State uh, to join the doctoral program there. So I'm actually a doctoral candidate finishing up my degree, hopefully pretty soon, um, but I study uh, new literacies, uh, digital literacies, and I'm really excited about this book because I recently just uh, designed a course for the Masters of Educational Technology program at Michigan State, and um, I, I put this book on the syllabus, and students are reading it now, and I just think that there are so many Im important ideas 
in this book about learning and about who we are as people and learners and um, how we can leverage uh, digital tools to, well, as you say, make us smarter um, as learners. And I, I love how it's how you introduce it sort of as a subversive book about education. <laughs> I'd love to talk um, about sort of your idea of the Big M mind as well. Right. But I'd also um, love, love to hear sort of just your, your recommendations for teachers, um, you know, advice you'd give teachers for how to really leverage digital tools effectively to support student learning. So those okay. are, you know, a couple of ideas that are on my mind. Good. But I've got Talk lots about all of them. Too. Good. Excellent. And Jim, could you do uh, a little bit of a longer introduction of yourself and then how you got came to this book? And then well, um, keep talking. Uh, I was, I've been a professor at uh, six or seven universities. I keep fighting with the administration. And um, so I've been tenured seven times. Uh, I was, uh, before I came to Arizona, at the University of Wisconsin, where I started a group called Games, Learning, and Society, which is uh, was really one of the first programs in the country on, devoted to games and learning. It's still thriving. It runs a wonderful conference, GLS, every June in Madison. I highly recommend it. Um, I came to uh, Arizona State five years ago. Uh, I'm part of a center called Games for Impact. Uh, by training, I'm a linguist. I first half of my career was in uh, theoretical linguistics. Uh, I then went on to work in discourse analysis and be more concerned with language and society. Um, and uh, have worked on issues of literacy and education for the last 10 years. I got into video games uh, just 10 years ago now when my then six-year-old was playing them and wrote my first book on video games uh, largely because I, I got into playing them and knew if I didn't write about them I wouldn't have a career left. Um, it was at a, just a very uh, interesting time. Uh, the, the, the wave of interest in games for impact games for learning hadn't yet really started and it started kind of right around the same time so the book has had quite an interesting career just by its timing. Great. Um, and and um, Aram has uh, joined us. Can you, can we hear you yet? I don't know if he wants to, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, I want to encourage people to interrupt as we go. Um, so, Jim, this book feels kind of uh, different. It's, it is. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've got to give me a little background to the book, and also it intersects with modern publishing because uh, the book uh, is, uh, was originally going to be called On Human Stupidity, and publishers don't like that, right? It's too too down. But it is a different book. It's about uh, it's about a problem. First of all, that Chom you know Chomsky, uh, that, you know when I worked in linguistics, he was our leader, and he always said there were and there were two classes of interesting problems. Uh, one he called Plato's problem, and by that he meant there are areas where humans look much better than you'd think, like learning language, right? Kids learn language that is so complex and yet there seems to be so little evidence for it. Uh, they're very good at it. And then, and he thought those areas were open to scientific investigation. But he also said there's a class of problems that he called Orwell's problems. And Orwell's problems is there's many cases where humans are much stupider than you think they would be. That they're impervious to evidence, that even in the face of evidence they believe the wrong thing. Uh, even copious evidence. And, I, you know, I, as an old academic, I had become convinced, especially working in education and society, that Orwell's problem is killing us, right? That we live in a society that simply ignores evidence, that uh, engages in arch stupidity, that is ruining our environment, ruining our schools, ruining our culture, uh, and that it's important to really say to people, the conversation about education, education reform, has got to cease to be about simply reforming schools and talk about reforming society and about what types of people we want to produce before it is too late. I mean, we're a, we're a country with the largest level of inequality we've had since the Depression. Uh, we know from all the evidence that high levels of inequality lead to a lack of production in society, to bad health, to bad economies, and yet we continue to push policies to do it. Global warming would be another example. We have engaged in a rhetoric around schools as if they are going to save all of society. And, and, and we keep 
ask, saying, here is the next magic bullet for school, without saying, uh, what does a society have to be like that it will tolerate the types of educational reform we want, which are based around equity? Mm -hmm. Was somebody wanting to jump in here? Feel free if you do. <laughs> well, let me just go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I, I found that um, it, it, that's just sure. such a compelling um, idea, right, that we have to focus now more than ever on the kind of people, right, that we want our children that's to right, grow right, into, right. the kind of people. Yeah, given given who, the fact that having having ignored evidence now for decades, we are going to face a time of great change. We know this without any doubt in global economy, global environment, uh, global civilization, immigration, and movement, we're going to face utter transformation. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we have to realize is it's late. We, we didn't operate on time, so we're going to face these problems, but it's not too late. Right. But we can't kid ourselves that there's easy solutions now. No. Uh, it's going to take hard ones. And one thing that it, it has impressed me is that given that this is a scenario, we are going to need to ask for every child, our own and the kids in school, how do I make a resilient, adaptable person who can adapt to change, put up with change, because they are going to face chaos. And that is about people. There is an actually new field emerging on resilience, saying that the goal of sustainability, it's too late for sustainability. We're not going to sustain our environments and our institutions in their current form. It's too late. We could have, we didn't do it. But that means they have to be resilient. People, families, institutions, schools. And resilient means being able to adapt to change, change with change, uh, and uh, and make a new world, and it it, it it requires the sorts of skills that I talk in the last part of the book: collective intelligence, the genuine ability to control technology and not let it control you. All of this seems to me to have deep implications for school. You know what our school, what what some of our schools are doing is producing the perfect employees for Walmart, our largest employer, right? People yeah. who have basic numeracy, basic literacy. Uh, don't get too sullen. We, you know, by the way, we have not only the highest inequality, but the way, growth of wages and benefits has gone way down. We've pretty much made most jobs in America bad jobs, right? You, you can't live on them, you can't get benefits on them. Um, so uh, we already are entering a time of great change. So th that's the book is about how, how do we get people smart through technology. I should point out, too, that uh, the, the book is arguing we can make people smarter th if we use technology in intelligent ways, but the implication is also we can make them stupider if, with technology as well. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, we keep talking about some of the new technologies as if they're magic bullets that automatically do you good, but in fact, they, they are, they're just as easy to use to make people stupid as they are to make them smart. So we ought to debate how do we make people smart and what sorts of smart people do we want. So one of the questions that came up two weeks ago um, when we were talking about your book um, had to do with audience and if you had a sense of who your audience was for this book. Because we were trying to figure out, it, it didn't seem like other scholars in the university necessarily. Um, so is this a book for the general American audience? Or? Well, you know, it's like my first video book, a trade book. It's, meant, it's not just meant for academics, but it is meant for academics too. But it's a weird book, as you said, because it's a book that's saying, look, business as usual is dead. Us academics, for example, we're, we're still doing business as usual when only, uh, you know, only 30% of uh, college jobs are tenure track, when the colleges are largely too expensive and irrelevant. Uh, we keep talking about reforming schools based on policies that have manifestly failed. You could be right or left wing, but the data is all showing that the accountability stuff, the way we test and drill, the claim that money doesn't matter to schools has all been shown to be false. So the book is really uh, an attempt for somebody who spent their life trying to understand stuff in, in a world, in a, you know, in academics where you're almost punished if you have an audience or, or, you know, if you publish in a journal and five people read it, you're great. If you put it up on the internet and 50,000 people read it, you're a panderer. Uh, and that's part of the reason we're in the mess we are, because we academics have not uh, had uh, impact. Uh, we have not allowed our teachers, 
in high school and elementary school to have any national voice. They, they're just supposed to talk about their classrooms, and we carry on a whole uh, decades-long uh, conversation on schools and teachers, and they're, what, that they're accountable for all of our problems, uh, and their voice is never in it. Right? They're never there. So uh, it's, it's a book that says, look, uh, it's crying in the wilderness probably, but it's my responsibility to, uh, you know, and all of our responsibility to say, look, it's late. These are serious problems, and we've got to stop business as usual. We've got to stop trivia, and I'm glad to say that to anybody who will listen. And, uh, you know, the irony, that theme, there's a lot of books coming out on that theme. Just as when I wrote my video game book, unbeknownst to me, tons of people soon came out with video game books, you're going to see a plethora of books on human stupidity is killing us and what we can do about it because it's getting to be obvious. So um, one of the you know things that are comes up early is your idea of the short circuit. You know we need to short circuit the circuit of human reflective action. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what that what well, that means? That circuit of human reflection uh, is is a really core point, and it's a hard point to put in an entertaining way. But let me put it differently to you. Um, the research in the learning sciences and in cognitive sciences has made clear that there are conditions under which human beings think well. They, they look smart. And there are conditions under which they don't think well and they look stupid. Now, the if you want a human being to be smart, what you do is you, you put them into real experience, not just a book. And you guide them, you help them, but they have to have a goal for action, right? So if they're in a real experience with guidance and they have a goal, there's something they want to accomplish, and they're getting from that experience feedback and images and, uh, you know, and not just words, they tend to be quite smart. But if you put them in a situation where they have no images, no actions to take, no goals, just a bunch of words, they tend to be very stupid. Right? And interestingly, what school does is it puts you into a situation where you have words but few goals of your own, no action to take, uh, and you can't marry the words to images and actions and experiences, right? It, it's stuff about chemistry, but there's nothing there around, and you have no goals in chemistry. I have described, you know, a lot of schooling is like giving a kid the game manual, a video game manual without the game, right? Mm -hmm. Chemistry is a game. It's a set of activities you do in the world, and when you do it, the world talks back. You, you do it based on images in the world and actions, goals you have. You get feedback from the world. You do have help. You have other chemists. Um, and, uh, com uh, but it, so it's a game. It's not a set of facts. It's a, it's a game. You use facts as tools to solve problems, but it's a game with rules, with norms, with conventions with achievements and everything else. And so what do we do in school? We give you the manual. It's called a chemistry textbook. And you rarely get any of the chemistry. And you certainly don't get much you care about, right, that you have any action to take. So what is this circuit? The circuit is just that humans get a goal and they probe the world. They, they're asking the world a question. I want to get this goal done. I'm going to try something. I'm going to try something. And then I hold back and say, did it work? I have to appreciate it. Did it work? Did what I did, did I get a good result or a bad result? Is it moving me closer to my goal or not? If it isn't, then I act again, and then I consult the world again. So this is simply a conversation with the world and respect for the world. A lot of what the book is about is that we don't respect the world, and, you know, and it bites us. Right? It's, it's really just a respect for evidence. Scientists do this circuit as well. They do something. They get feedback from the world. It, if it isn't right, they do it again until they have gotten to the goal they want to get. It's a respectful conversation with the world in which you uh, probe the world and reflect on its response. Uh, we do that in our daily lives. None of us could get around the world in our daily lives. But what we, where we cease to do it is when we're being citizens and when we're in school. Uh, look at the way the United States disrespects what the world says. L fracking is a good example. It's illegal to even tell people what the chemicals are in fracking. All over Pennsylvania, people are l literally getting sick, 
water and animals are dying, earthquakes are happening from it, and yet we, uh, we simply, that's the world saying, hey, if you keep this up, I'm going to bite, I'm going to bite. It's like a dog snarling at you, and you go to pet it again and again and again. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, everybody, because there's great money to be made on fracking, is going out and saying, of course, we don't know that it's unsafe. You can't prove that all those dead fish were from us. But uh, we've done a lot of that, right? And the world, you know, Hurricane Sandy, uh, the world is, is, is bitten back. Um, notice that after, uh, you know, two, nearly two decades of No Child Left Behind, the gaps in race are as bad as they were when we started, but we did manage to have one achievement. We let the gap, the gap by class passed for the first time, the gap by race. So not only do we not close the race gap, we actually made the class gap worse than that. And what did we do? We continued the policies. So that's the, we, we, you know, we're talking about something very fundamental. I, I, I never thought as a 65-year-old it'd have to be said in a book that evidence counts and that when you don't respect the world, uh, it bites back. It bites back in policy, it bites back in science, and it bites back in your daily life. Schools should be about how to respect the world, and that is partly about how to respect evidence. And then, of course, in our world, since this always ties to questions that are quite complex about government and about the global world, you then are going to have to be able to think about complex systems. You're going to have to think about very complex things um, and have the tools to do so, and we're not giving people those tools. So... Go ahead, Joel. <laughs> Jim, it, it just as as like a practical matter, um, so so based on what you just said, like your typical eighth grade ELA English student, what should your typical eighth grade student uh, in an English classroom be doing um, in order to do all those things, respecting the world, valuing evidence? Like, what kind of activities you see helping to promote promote that type of thinking, etc. Well, you know, it's so the thing which you in any class, English or not, but English could be a great example because, of course, one thing that you want to be teaching in English and will and will have to be teaching when the Common Core comes around is argumentation. But you see, if I want to teach you about argumentation, I first have to have something you want to argue over, right? Some issue, something you care about, and then you have to have experience with that issue, which is not just reading. Reading's important. But take like a video game. Nobody reads the manual first. They play the game, they get the images and actions in their mind, and then they're driven to read about it to get better and to understand it at a more abstract level. So we're talking about kids having to work on something um, that they can experience in the world that, that, that encourages them to read that uh, they then get a, a, a motivation to, that they care about, and then you can begin to teach how argumentation works, right, uh, at a deep level. And now, now you're giving them a 21st century skill, right, because given that we're going to face issues like global warming, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the pol political polarization of America, all this stuff, the, the, uh, this t understanding how argumentation works, how evidence works, can be crucial. What problem you pick uh, doesn't matter, in, it, but what you need to do is pick one that is deep and where there are not trivial answers. Uh, one that has really interested me, but you know, we could, we could take a billion of these, is the big controversy now over processed food. Because processed food appear, appears to be the main cause of obesity. It, it, it interacts with a brand new understanding of chemistry that, for example, chemicals even if you have the same chemical that you made in a lab, it is not doesn't act the same way it does in a piece of food. Uh, and the thing about processed food is you could imagine kids in chemistry studying it, you could imagine pe people studying it in history, um, and uh, in English, uh, looking at the ample arguments over it uh, that are all over the media. So, and I'm actually a big fan of trying to get kids in different areas to understand that most serious problems are not in one area, that you're going to use your skills of literacy and argumentation, science, uh, by the way, how to, how to graphically represent the issues. Uh, so I, w I love to see kids and, and, and teachers cooperating to see that uh, 
these skills you're getting, you know, today with this mania for STEM, it, we've separated science and art and English so thoroughly uh, that we're not equipping people for real world skills to be interveners and activists, right? So and that's just one of my pet peeves, processed food. The literature on it is, is wonderful. Um, but you can pick any air, any sets of issues which are hard problems, right? A global warming would be one. Um, you know that one one would be good. Here's a, a good one. Why in the hell have the humanities anymore? See, recently uh, the state of Texas had a blue ribbon panel that was supposed to advise the governor on how to pr make the cost of college. Um, uh, lower in Texas, and one of their recommendations is kids should pay extra tuition for any course in the humanities or arts uh, because they're so worthless, <laughs> right? For job, for getting jobs, it's all about getting jobs. Well, you know, my God, if you you're teaching English and people can't answer, why that's stupid? Um, but <laughs> so. Can, can, or can by I? the way, how it could even happen? How it could happen that a blue ribbon commission thinks that the only thing that you're going to college for is to get a job when three-fifths of the jobs in America are service work and bad jobs and the biggest employer is Walmart. You see, I mean, if you think the purpose of schooling is to prepare kids for jobs, then, you, uh, then what you're saying is you're preparing three-fifths or more of them for bad jobs. That doesn't sound like a good occupation. And yet the rhetoric that school is all about work now is all pervasive in our political parties, and from yeah. kindergarten on through college, uh, because it's a way of evading that the vast majority of jobs are producing are bad jobs, and their former good ones have lost their unions and their benefits and their living wages, right? So, uh, Jim, I, you know, I, I guess what I would say is that it's very important in English or anything else that context. Kids should under any problem you pick that says, look, this is complicated and context matters, right? That's, that's important. That's great. I, I wanted to I wanted to ask if um, and this would be rewinding a little bit here, but um, are you suggesting that um, you know the English classroom at least be more open to other disciplines being involved there too, or maybe we don't? It's a question that I always ask uh, frequently on this show. Like, what is English anymore? Do we need English? Um, has it changed? No, we because don't, in your we don't description need English. there, Jim, you didn't, yeah. you didn't mention literature. And most of my colleagues, when they think of what is my curriculum going to be, organize curriculum around literature still. So, Well, there's two different yeah. questions. So first of all, yeah. for me, English should not be a, a just about literature. Uh, we confront... Uh, if you want to confront science or social science or anything in the world as having impact, then it is that impact is mediated through language and text and or argumentation, right? And so the English classroom should be about how do you as a citizen leverage the, the technical, complex, specialist language of debates in various areas. How do you learn something, get that content, so that you can make it actively something for you to intervene on and write about and, and understand as a critical reader. That's what it should be. And therefore, there's no reason why you shouldn't teach with an historian or with a scientist. But see, the trouble is the, the, the disciplinary people, the scientists, I think it has nothing to do with language. But on the other hand, we also don't think any things we're teaching should have anything to do with impact in the world, that is, with producing activist citizens. It's part of the problem. We have such a bad world. Now, what about the role of literature? There's a chapter in this book on what I call story truths. The, mm -hmm. book, the book talks about how vulnerable human beings are, for various reasons, to believing things that are comfortable but false, right? has a lot of stuff about mental comfort stories. And life is harsh. You know, we're, we're going to die. We have huge inequality. Many people are struggling. Uh, and, and it's not surprising in the least that they turn to either religion or stories that comfort them, uh, but that also insulate them from having to face the facts of reality. Right. You know, Jim. And, what, can I just um, add to sure. that a little bit? Um, the one of the one of the things that I thought in, in reading um, through uh, those chapters about comfort stories is that one of the comfort stories teachers have is teacher lore, like how we were taught, how you know exactly. how we think we should be taught. So those are comfort stories for many. They teachers. are comfort oh, stories, yeah. and there's nothing inherently wrong with them. But what we do in America now is we have a lot of people who either religiously or ideologically or to sell you stuff, make up comfort stories 
uh, if you do this, you'll get rich, or it's all being caused by the brown people. Or, uh, and so there is a role for what I call story truths, and that is this, is that the scientist or the social scientist said, well, you know, I'm neutral, I'm disinterested, I just write this in academic prose. They can't move people with it. And what people writing great literature do, but also great nonfiction uh, literature, the nonfiction that really tells a story, is you get these skills to take a story that's true, but tell it in a way that makes that truth meaningful and empowering to people. And we are really bad at doing this, right? We got, we've got, you know, you look at you know, the, the wonderful things we've discovered in science and how few Americans know anything about them because we don't write it for them and we don't write it as a way of being meaningful. You know, the majority of Americans don't believe in evolution. One of the deepest discoveries, but also one of the most beautiful discoveries in the world. And uh, they, so, uh, you know, and, and you know, anybody who could write either a good novel or uh, write not good nonfiction about global warming or about uh, processed food or about the way that humans have become echo chambers only talking to people who believe the same thing as them uh, and, and where there's ample facts but where there isn't is the talent to communicate those facts through the noise of the false comfort stories. Um, there's one kind of solution. Ahead, Jesse, Jesse oh, you're next. Go ahead. I, wanted Go ahead, Chris. To get, yeah. I wanted to get to <laughs> Michelle's point, sorry, yeah. just to transition. There's one solution that you mentioned, that's this big minds thing and Michelle maybe you could phrase mm -hmm. what initially you wanted to talk about yeah no I uh, yeah there's uh, there's so many ideas swimming around in my mind right now um, but this idea right of there's there's a couple of ideas that I'd like to talk about and mm -hmm. one of the one of the ideas is essentially that um, you know the the effective use of the, uh, the 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 thoughtful and smart use of technologies to 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 counter act, right, our tendencies, our, our naturally right. <laughs> stupid human tendencies to sort of believe all things and, you know, it just it, in the stuff that I see. Especially consuming, when you're scared, right. Right, especially when you're scared or you're overwhelmed or you don't really know, right. um, you know, you don't have enough experience. I mean, I, I'm, I study ninth graders reading on the internet. I mean, trying to construct an understanding from the wild, you know, the wilds of the interwebs and right. it's hard for them to know right. what to trust and what to believe and, and what's important. Um, so I, I would love to talk a little bit about how we leverage digital tools to support these kinds of critical literacies and these kinds of you know ideas. Right. But the other point is this notion of sort of the the echo chamber, right? That digital technologies can also you know lead us into, right? Sort of that the right. Facebook you know the filter kind of phenomenon that um, Eli Parise also talks about, right? And the, right. this this idea that we we're, we're not smart, and that one of your solutions is that we have to get better about, you know, using our collective, right. you know, right. our Well, there's a lot of stuff there, uh, yeah. and uh, let me just say, before I forget it on that last one, is that the internet and the social media can give rise to these echo chambers where you just communicate with like-minded people and even Absolutely. polarize, because the only way yeah. to get that is to be the most extreme. Uh, but you see collective intelligence, that is when you're going to try to go beyond the intelligence of any one person requires diversity. So by yes. definition, those won't work because you are sealing out crucial pieces of information that you don't have access to. Um, however, to the, the uh, shared mind stuff or the big mind stuff, uh, let me start by uh, saying that um, it's a common theory, and, and, and at some level right, that one of the reasons humans are not very smart is that we, are, we have this primitive mind, right? Our bodies and our minds were evolved as hunter-gatherers where it was very small groups of people. They knew each other intimately, um, and we're, we were never prepared for the level of complexity uh, that faces us in modern cultures, right? We, our mind by evolution couldn't catch up to it. And there's some truth to that. It, 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 humans, I think, are more adaptable than that. Here's what I think. I think that our minds were, as I say in the book, always, always meant that they evolved to be what I call plug-and-play devices. You were never meant to be intelligent all by yourself. That's why we have language, right? You were meant to, you were meant to network with people, to share their knowledge together in yours, um, and yours, uh, and use whatever tools you had, language being one of them, but 
fire was another one, um, and that we were we, but there's this idea that we're smart, that we carry around smart heads, and that we are individually smart, I think is not right. I think we only we are a plug and play device looking for good other people and good tools to plug in. Now that means, of course, you ought to think carefully about what you plug into. Right. Who do you plug into and who do you, what tools do you use? Second thing I want to say is that if you, if you want to talk about how to use technology to make people smarter, that is to make them uh, this distributed intelligence or the shared minds where they've got good tools and good people with them, uh, you have to first not talk about technology. It, technology is just a tool. You have to say, what sorts of relationships do I want the people to have, and what sorts of learning do I want them to do? What sorts of problems do I want to get solved? Then you say, of all the technologies available to me, one of which, and the most important of which, is oral language, face-to-face -face talk, but also books and social media and games and simulations and multimedia, multimodal media, all the technology. Then you say, how do I use the best of those how do I network them to facilitate this learning that is collaborative and shared? Uh, and what I see today, and I do a lot of consulting with game companies and stuff and with digital, everyone says, okay, I got this technology X. I'm going to make it do everything. I'm going to, it'll be the solution to everything. That, that, we already did that. That's called the textbook. The worst piece of technology ever made because it tried to use one thing, namely this book, to do everything. We don't want to repeat that by saying, okay, now let's use games to do everything. So, you know, it's the interesting thing, don't start with technology, start with the learning and the problem solving. Then you have to say, what resource is that? What makes these people smarter together than they are separately? And, how to, and that's what a teacher is doing. You know, you're leading, you're resourcing, you're mentoring. Um, and you're, you want to be agnostic towards tools, and you want to realize that face-to-face uh, uh, -face communication has still got a crucial role. Uh, books, for example, lectures still have a crucial role, but on demand, that is, people, when the people need them and want them. Uh, we don't want to be liberal or conservative about this. We want to say, what's the, it's like if you had a team. What's the best resources I can give this team? And today, uh, learning how to get into a network where you are respecting the tools you have and the people you have. You have tools and people both. And by the way, respecting the world you're in so that we see the world as one of our tools, one of the things that has to be respected that we want to network with to leverage in the proper way uh, is crucial. And it's hard in school because collaboration is often viewed as cheating. And we still ban calculators in some math classes, right? Uh, but uh, we, so the, the, the idea is really to begin to get people to, I mean, I often use the example of Alan Greenspan. Uh, he, you know, he's our 20th century notion of an expert. You get a degree, you're, it's in one thing called economics, and therefore you know all you need to know. And you see every problem as an economics problem. Well, he, he helped bring on the 2008 um, recession, and then he went to Congress and said, boy, nothing in my 40 years in economics ever told me this would happen. I never saw it coming. Um, and the reason was, is, is that problems today are all based in complex systems in which if you are a traditional expert, that is, you know a lot about one thing, but you really don't know well what, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. you are a danger now. You are a danger. Modern science, modern policy is done by people using collective intelligence, looking for different pieces of information for the people who may know something you don't know, respecting profoundly what you don't know, and realizing no serious problem is solvable by one discipline. So I, I, you know, I view Alan as the symbol of the last expert. Uh, they were the people who screwed us. Now I will say, um, if you follow, and I think it's crucial, the maker movement, the fab movement, mm -hmm. kids today and everybody, kids and adults, can produce and make stuff and can get together in what I call those affinity spaces and learn to the point of expertise where they are competing with experts with credentials and they don't need the credentials. We are, an, ironically, as our notion of the 20th century expert, the Alan Greenspans, die, we are creating a whole notion of expertise not tied to certificates but tied to your ability to network with other people, to solicit difference and solve problems. 
Jesse, I wanted to give you a chance to get your question in there. Yeah, no, I'm, I've sort of moved on to other places in my brain, but I'm thinking now about this notion of the expert and thinking that um, what, so what you're proposing replaces the expert is your ability to make connections, um, make connections between people. It also and seems tools, like... And tools, and tools, though. We have to, I mean, if you've ever, I'm a big fan of Bruno Latour. I don't know if you guys have read him, but his work is really about the way in which uh, when you... Uh, solve problems. You are you are using the world and other people and they are using you. It's a, like a dance. You have to respect, for example, the world. It, you, you can't cook with shellfish and not respect the shellfish or you'll poison yourself. You have to look at the affordances of the world and of your tools. So when I say I have about, talk about a, a big M mind or collective intelligence or synchronized intelligence, I'm talking about people who can network with each other but with their tools and where the unit that is actually performing is that network. Um, and therefore, uh, and where you have to respect the tool as a participant. It can't, see this is another thing. If you're going to use games or you're going to use simulation, social media, augmented reality, it can't do everything. It does some things well and some things poorly. So you have to say, I got to respect the affordances of this tool. Just as I have to respect the affordances of you as a human being, uh, you're good at some things and bad at others, and we're trying to get us all to supplement our weaknesses uh, with tools and with other people. Any follow-up, Jesse? <laughs> good. If there's um, any no, no, World of Warcraft players, if you, I don't know, do you guys play World of Warcraft? <laughs> yes, I do I, play World of yeah, Warcraft. Well, I mean, if you look at a hunting party, a five-person party going into a dungeon, uh, it's a perfect example. You know, you don't bring in five priests. You bring in uh, five people, each of whom are really skilled at a different thing, but know how to respect each other's skills and know how to integrate with them, and they come in with what's called mods or these tools like damage meters, and they then get to be very smart together. And well, I think uh, some, know, of the interesting. Most, yep. some of the most successful people in the world of Warcraft are actually the people who can move effortlessly between roles and who can, at the drop of a hat, a person is missing in your party, another person can flexibly move from one role to another, and so we're actually right. moving away from the expert and more towards the bricolure or the generalist being the person uh, absolutely who uh, if in that type of intelligence if he, if the team gets loses something that the rest of the team has to adapt um, uh, the interesting thing is if you're in one of those dungeons you do have to be good at your character if you switch from a uh, uh, somebody who's tanking to play a priest, you do, you've got to really be good but you see the reason kid, people have alts and can switch is uh, they have, even as they're playing any one character, they have to be very understanding of the skills the other ones have. And one of the best ways to do that is try them out. I mean, uh, when I was at one time switching to be a priest, you know, the people who really taught me were people who weren't playing priests during that dungeon but had alts as priests and really understood it and could mentor me and help me. Um, uh, to do it. So you're absolutely right. that It is knowledge. You have to be good at what you're at, but you have to understand what the other people do and even be able to step into their shoes. You know, in workplaces, high-tech workplaces, they call these cross-functional teams. They demand them. They are the way we work at the cutting edge of technology, and they're the way we play. Ironically, they're not the way we do school. One thing that's true about tools is that, that tools are so rapidly changing that you become an expert in one tool and that tool immediately changes. So there's actually a way in which, how would you respond to the notion that being an expert in a particular tool is actually closing down your ability to be flexible and adaptable to whatever the next tool is? I, I think you're dead right. I think that, again, people have, that's why the book has got a lot about you better be a producer and not a consumer, and you better have kind of a meta-awareness about what you're doing. You better be a maker, because I think more than being an expert in a tool, you have to be a tool maker. So again, I'll use the World of Warcraft example. Um, if you get the mods but have no understanding of how they're made or how what they're inside of them, you're just kind of the laity, right? 
and then you're screwed if somebody makes a new mod you gotta learn it all again if you get your hands dirty modding and kinda understand how these tools are made and you you, you take as many kids do and you just don't take the tools the way they're given to you you transform them you change them then what you are is you are prepared for future learning with new tools you're even prepared to make tools um, it's, I couldn't agree with you more being a consumer of tools in the end just screws you because uh, I also think that uh, we have, Microsoft is a center at this level it has been for decades as we make stuff more user friendly we make a but we make the consumer idiots right they, they can't they don't understand at all what stuff is doing um, and they can't actually do what they want to do they can only do what Microsoft wants them to do and that's a good paradigm when a society has got a good economy and everybody's middle class and they're all happy as clams. It's going to be disastrous in the future because change is going to come too fast. And the people who can't innovate, can't mod, can't uh, uh, transform and adapt things could be really in trouble, right? We know people are going to have to learn new things fast. And they're certainly going to have to know how to draw out knowledge from other people because it, the world isn't going to be stable enough to be an expert on something very long. Yeah, I, I would say the, the Mozilla webmaker tools are trying to answer some of that because they're mm -hmm. trying to show yeah. what's behind indeed, the, indeed. the curtains. And, and there is, of course, a huge movement in games today to, for, for uh, kids to build games, for games to come with the tools that you can mod them. I certainly wish curriculum came with modding tools for the kids to make pieces <laughs> of it. Can I, I? I need. I need to circle around this um, I, before I get to the question. But but here's. I want to point out that when you asked, "Are you World World, world of Warcraft players?" Um, one of us raised our hand halfway. The other raised his hand hallway, and and most of us um, then got quiet. That happens in my classroom too when I ask the same question. Like most of my kids aren't right. A few are, and I think there's a lot that we can learn. Obviously. From, mm -hmm. from seeing how kids are working in that way. But a sure. lot of kids aren't gamers. Um, so that's, that's sort of one thing I wanted to ask about. But I guess what I wanted to ask really is... Um, See, but, let me, about, but let me say something yeah, about that. I mean, you know, about 92% yeah, of kids have played games. A lot of... You know, you don't want to use the word gamer. You know, what we found out is if you ask, are you a gamer, they'll say no. And then if you say, do you play games, yes. Gamer can carry a lot of weight. But it isn't important to me whether kids are gamers or not. Um, all kids are people who in their daily life learn from experience when they have goals and are smart when they're trying to achieve their own goals and they're resourced appropriately, right? All of them are. And um, So whether they're doing that in a game or they're doing that... They make no difference. If they want to go on plan for bed... Make well, we're going to make a distinction between World of Warcraft and Angry Birds um, because the thing is I think a lot of what you're saying applies just as easily to a game like Angry Birds or maybe something like Little Big Planet, um, right? Which or even Minesweeper, yes. which are all, sort of all games about doing yeah. the kind or of Minecraft, you know, not, today. Not Minecraft, right? Is it? Thing, but you know, the thing is, what games are? All games are is a well-controlled, well-designed space for problem solving, often collaboratively, right? And that's really all I'm saying is we need to create. That's what schools should be about. That's what good teachers always do. Is you're creating a safe, well-designed, well-guided, well-resourced um, place where people can. Uh, solve problems with others and uh, learn from each other uh, and that's what a good game is but that's what a good classroom ought to be and you don't have to have any one particular game to do it uh, the con you know I, w I wanted to say too that you know the you know for years conservatives you know conservative educators say well the way education ought to work is just tell everybody everything just direct instruction but you know and that's obvious we know that does not work People are, cannot learn much from language until they've had some experience to connect it to. But you know, the liberals often say, oh, ki kids are just so smart, just turn them loose on problems in the world and let them work on them and they'll learn. Well, no, because in fact they're way too creative for that. They hit on the wrong solutions that are creative but don't work again. You know, we know that it, it, what you have to do is have people doing problem solving in well-mentored, well-resourced, well-instructed areas. For example, it is absolutely crucial in a problem-solving space that kids work on the, the first problems they work on 
are highly generative to for hypotheses and solutions that will work later on, right? That will send them down a good path and not mm -hmm. a garden path. Now, if you again, if you look at games, that's all. That's what they call level design. No one starts the game with the hardest level. The first levels are there to say, look, get a feel for the shape of these problems. Get practice at stuff you're going to have to use a lot. Uh, let's explore the types of hypotheses that might be the best ones to be drawing. And then as you get better and better and well practiced, each level gets harder. So this is neither conservative nor liberal pedagogy. It, it, and it's certainly not pedagogy with no teacher. We have a lot of people who want to use artificial agents, artificial tutors and games to get rid of teachers. But you know, a good game has a teacher. It's called the game design. It's very, very well designed for learning. And the other thing is games almost always have affinity spaces next to them where the players are actively teaching each other and resourcing each other. Monica, I wanted to give you a chance to get your voice in here um, a little bit. Monica Hardy, do you have a thought or a question that you'd like to pose? Or? Um. Like you guys, several. So I'm I'm open to if someone else has something burning. I don't want to. Okay. Well, <laughs> could we talk more about affinity spaces? I, sure. I think um, that'd be a good way to go. I, yeah. I'll jump right. into that. Uh, there's a <laughs> quote. Um, Imagine a college that was nothing but hundreds of linked affinity spaces yeah. built around many different important problems or endeavors, and that's very resonating because that's what we're trying to do as a city. And the city is the school with that yeah. design. So there's your lead into affinity that's, space. That's that. It seems like that requires, it, that that requires us to break down notions of sort of conventional notions of courses and absolutely uh, to absolutely. rethink what's the center of, it's not about connecting courses, it's about connecting people. Right. You know, the, our colleges are based, and so are high schools, they're based on Carnegie units, right? They're based on everybody learning the same thing at the same time for the same amount of time. Uh, that's today dead and ridiculous, but almost uh, impossible to kill off. So, Who cares but, but, whether I, it took... Uh, yeah? Jim, I, yes, it's dead intellectually, but it is the way we run school still, right? Right, that's what I meant by it's okay. almost impossible to kill off. It's like a zombie okay. that won't die. Uh, who cares? Let's say a guy learned algebra in six weeks, and it took me six months. But then I win the Nobel Prize. I mean, who cares? Um, uh, so an affinity space is about the idea that people join something together uh, for, because they have a shared passion. Maybe they start with only an interest, but they know that there's people there that have a passion and you're supposed to respect it. The passion's an attractor. They're there and they develop common ways to solve problems in this passion. And they're there not for race, class, or gender, not for age, not for experts versus newbies. They're there because of that. Furthermore, they can contribute a little or a lot. They can go in once, they can go in a thousand times. So it's a, And it's not age graded at its best. And see, think about this. If you were to do that in a school, uh, let's, I have a colleague who teaches the uh, Italian Renaissance, and he's you know, always bemoaning it's hard to get a lot of students to take the Italian Renaissance. Well, you know, if you played Assassin's Creed, that, that game completely <laughs> creates the Italian Renaissance in every space, person, and building. So imagine we create uh, a world for anybody who's interested in living in the Renaissance, right? Just come in. And you're going to, you know, there's some stuff you've got to get and learn and do. Um, for your grade, and when you learn or do it, you get the grade. And it could be a year or a week. On the other hand, once you get your grade, you don't have to leave. You could stay there. You could be building parts of the Renaissance. You could be creating parts of the curriculum for other people. See, uh, now you got your school, it, it, the school site there, that your, your alumni guy is there 10 years, right? Loyalty. But furthermore, it, it, uh, pretty soon you as the person who seeded that world, the world has been completely constructed and lots of its curriculum by, it, the, by its users. Some of them old, some of them experts, some of them newbies, so pretty soon it has a life of its own, right? And you go to a college and say, well, we can't do that because we wouldn't know how to charge tuition or where's the Carnegie units? Well, you see, that, that's an example of human stupidity. 
And if you look at, uh, there's a book I wrote with my wife called Women as Gamers, and it looks at a lot of affinity spaces where, where uh, in particular, ma mainly women and girls are building and designing stuff for The Sims, the best-selling game in the world. And, it, you know, you see people learning and getting to levels of expertise that are mind-blowing. Uh, and you don't see any of the features of our typical schools. There, there is no time limits. Uh, newbies and experts are together. There's no A. There's six, uh, 12 year olds and 60 year olds. Uh, people are doing what they, you know, they, they, sometimes they're leading, sometimes they're following, sometimes they mentor, sometimes they get mentored. The, the, it is resourced with ample tools for learning that you can choose how to use, and people will mentor you on how to use it. If you want a lecture, you can get it. Um, you know, and different affinity spaces have different norms, too. So, you know, we contrast two of them there, where one is a tough love space, right? You know, they really enforce the rules, and you better, you know, be good or not. And the other one is a more nurturing one. Both of them produce very high levels of knowledge. You choose the norm structure you want, um, and you do that. Now, affinity spaces can be bad or good. But the point is that they have features that we know are allowing even 12-year-olds to get expert enough to be educating the 60-year-olds. Well, there's plenty of 60-year-olds educating the 12-year-olds. So, uh, so to me, you've just described a city. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, yes. that's uh, well, not an American that. city. Not much American cities as we have now because we don't, uh, we've destroyed our public spaces. But I couldn't agree with you more. I'd love to see... Uh, our idea, you know, I think the old idea of a public sphere is really was an affinity space in real space. Uh, absolutely, I've never thought about it, but I think that's exactly right. And uh, there is n one of our biggest problems today is the way in which Americans have torn apart uh, any public space or public sphere. You know, when I travel around the world, there is no country I've been in where the word public is a dirty word, except in America. If you say to an American, public park, public bathroom, uh, department of motor vehicles, I mean, anything that's public, it has a tinge of lowness and dirtiness, which you don't see in other countries. And, and we also know tons of Americans go right by the urban center. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that, uh, uh, that it's a key goal to re rehabilitate the public so we're not just segregating ourselves and public spaces in the public sphere, and um, I, I never thought of the connection, but I think that's a good one. It, it should be as powerful as an affinity space, right? So Can I throw in a link for you? That's what we're working great. on. So good. I'd love to, I'd love to see it. A look at it. Great. Can I, and can I, can I, can I just, um, I, I'm not literal enough, but I think sometimes um, I'm not the only one. Um, when you talk about affinity spaces in the abstract, right? Um, I, I kind of get it in the abstract, but then when you, the example comes from Sims, and it just you just did that again, um, I don't think you're saying okay now we should do Sims in the classroom necessarily. No, you're not I'm saying, saying that right? your class. So see, here's an interesting thing, and, yeah. and people have asked it. Uh, ideally, see, look, the class. If your if your uh, classroom was an affinity space, first of all. It would not. It wouldn't matter what your race, class, gender was, because everybody's there for the passion. They're there because of common uh, interest or passion. Uh, they can use their other identities, like the race, class, and gender, strategically for bringing in knowledge. But they, they don't. They're not forced to be seen in that identity alone. Uh, it is not age graded. Uh, people can become experts in one thing and teach others and vice versa. It, it's got porous leadership and it's based on doing stuff, not, you know, producing and not just consuming. Now here's the interesting thing. People, uh, especially in the area of composition, there's been quite an interest to turn the composition classroom, the freshman writing classroom, for example, into an affinity space. You know, let kids choose different themes and then you write and produce on something for which you share a passion with others regardless of their background. What kills it is grading, right? Because the thing with an affinity space is there's a set of standards, high standards, that emerge from the, the, the people who have the deepest passion and who are the most further along. And they set, the, this is what it, you know, if you want to be accepted as a builder in The Sims, it's got to be this good. And we'll help you get there, and we'll mentor you, and you're, uh, we don't care whether it takes you a week or a year, um, but you're not going to get uh, the rewards for nothing, 
and you're not going to get thrown out because you failed, right? Now in school, uh, if you by the end of the term you haven't done it, you fail, right? Um, and the grade is given to you by a teacher, not by the internal standards of the group. So if you look at good fan fiction writing sites, the best fan fiction writing sites hold extremely high standards for the writing. But they help people reach them if they want to. Uh, and they don't give you a grade ba uh, based on uh, something exterior to what the group is about. So again, we're caught up with the Carnegie unit and, and having to give an A or a B or a C in some time limit uh, when affinity spaces don't work that way. By the way, um, the affinity space idea was connected to some literature that goes back to the 80s by uh, scholars in uh, Europe that uh, were looking at the original green movements in Europe at which they called morally heated affinity groups or morally heated affinity spaces where you get people in the green movement, some of them conservatives, some liberals, some Nazis, that all of a sudden were able to background their differences because they shared a common endeavor, a common cause, and common tools, and uh, were able to do that. And it became, you also saw it in the, uh, when the, the biggest voucher program in America is in Milwaukee, where the African Americans had wanted them in order to have their own schools, and had for years partnered with the Democrats, because that was ideologically their most likely partner, and they got nothing, so they partnered with Tommy Thompson, the neoconservatives, uh, who wanted vouchers for very different reasons, and they all got together with a passion and got that done, and then they're in different affinity spaces now fighting each other. So it's a way to say, look, we can, I could share a lot with you in one area, and we can get together and on the same page. That doesn't mean that I have to share everything with you. I, I, you know, I don't always have to ask whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're a, a feminist or not. There, you know, if I have a common cause here, uh, I, we can take on identities that are in that shared cause. And see, if, if we don't do that in the modern world, if we keep waiting around for all the people that we agree with to get the solutions, we're in trouble, right? Because we're so polarized now that we don't know how to go across ideological differences to do pragmatic stuff. And yet people do on the, it, these kids in affinity spaces and the adults in affinity spaces, they do know how to do that. They don't ask you on an affinity space or like fold it where they fold proteins. They don't ask you, are you Republican or you a Democrat? You know, do you believe in abortion or not? It, we'll fight those battles someplace else. We don't have to fight them in every space. Uh, we've got to have some spaces where we actually solve a problem. Jim, one of the affinities that I share with you from reading your book is uh, bird watching. Good. Uh, recently, great. so, yeah, great. Great. so great. I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, when we're out watching birds, uh, politics. Yeah, you're not asking whether <laughs> you're, pop but you know, the bird watching is a, a good thing too. I'm sure you know this. If you're a bird watcher, you know, uh, a bird, the the people who are really expert bird watchers, which is not me are very open and generous in sharing their knowledge as long as you don't pretend to be what you aren't, right? In other words, um, you know, you, you start saying, well, that dodo I saw back there was the cat. You know, they, uh, but, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. It, it's, it, the, they expect you to share a passion uh, for birds, and, they, and they, do nor they create very high norms, but they're open to anybody meeting them. That's right. And, you know, yeah, age doesn't matter. Thing is really interesting. Right. Yeah. But as an affinity space, it also, you can get a lot out of it without wanting to be an expert, right? As long as you respect the passion, can't say, oh, I think people who really know how to identify the birds are idiots. Uh, you have to, no, but, but as long as you say, well, I, I really enjoy seeing the birds and I enjoy learning, nobody's saying to you, you can't be here because you're not as good as Sibley or somebody. See? Um, the, the, the role of failure is very different, too. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. school's a winner-take-all thing. Whoever gets the highest grades, the best. Everybody else is some flavor of loser. And um, uh, that isn't true in bird watching. Jim, I had a question. In all your travels and consulting, have you come across schools, um, you know, as we currently define them, that that are coming close to affinity spaces, or or have you found some some glimmer of hope with? Uh, 
Well, I'm not sure we can do it in schools, at least with our No Child Left Behind and the Carnegie units and the grades. I, I think we could do it. My suspicion, and I haven't visited a lot, well, I have visited some, <laughs> some of the nicer schools that are really doing well around this happen to be quite rich, right? Because they're exempted from all of that problems. But you know, at a deeper level, uh, you know, uh, so MacArthur has two schools, one in Chicago, one in New York, both public schools called Quest to Learn. They're trying it. They're, they're, you know, again, they're going to bump up against the testing regime. They're trying it, but you know, it's there's a deeper thing. America, it, it and this is part of the thing in the book. Uh, we can't pretend that reforming schools will will make us a better society because uh, we have to have a society that will tolerate good schools, right? If this society really wants three-fifths of the kids to go to work in, at places like Walmart so their kid can get a good job, they're not that, we don't have a society that wills that the other kids get that chance. Now, America has twice had the will to educate people. Once after Sputnik went up, we made superlative curriculum. Man, a course of study was very interesting. Lots of excellent science stuff, of course, all based on problem solving, conceptual thinking, uh, good tools. And, and why? Because we thought, wow, we're going to lose to the Russians. Once the Sputnik controversy was over, we went back to skill and drill schools. And then in the 80s, when Japan was uh, beating our economy, and we thought it was because the Japanese were making every student a knowledge worker, uh, we put in things like Ann Brown's Community of Learners and a whole bunch of other excellent things that are very along the lines we're talking about. And then by the 90s, we discovered it isn't true that the break on a modern economy is the, a lack of knowledge workers, because, of course, you can get them all over India. Uh, it was service workers, right? The, if you, uh, and our economy came back, the Japanese went down, and so we got no child left behind. So if you wanted... We have to change the society to get the will to say uh, we want to do it. Crisis is one which, historically, that means a crisis for America. And um, I do think we do have a crisis, not only the global warming crisis, but the inequality crisis, the growth of inequality that is killing us in our health. That may come to be uh, one of the things that will do this. But I will say one of the things that I think we have to get off of the rhetoric of school is about the job you're going to get because uh, we don't have lots of jobs are not good jobs so school has to be about having a productive life as a citizen being able to find worth agency and production either on your job or outside your job I mentioned the game fold it where people fold proteins to help scientists uh, where they've discovered one of the proteins that cause AIDS they've won lots of awards there's people there's beautiful um, things on YouTube where a woman in England comes home and says, you know, I'm a service worker. I don't get any respect at work. People don't treat me as a knower, but I do know. I do know how to do stuff. Then I come home and I play Fold It and I, 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 I feel I'm contributing, feel I know stuff. I've joined a Fold It guild. I can discuss. See, so she, in America, we'd say, well, she doesn't matter because she doesn't make money. But see, she is getting her dignity, her sense of control off market, not on market. Now, if she didn't have that, her life would be that job she hates. And you as an educator should think not about, am I, is this kid going to end up in a, in a great job, but is the kid going to end up to have the abilities to have a great life? That is, to be able to somewhere contribute their skills. And the world is full of places to contribute your skills that are not in your job, right? Now, ironically, a lot of these places where people like that unfolded or the designing for the stems or doing citizen science, a lot of that stuff does begin to give new skills for jobs and even starts new businesses. Right? So it, that, it, it does cycle back. But our, our real interest must be is how does each person protect themselves from the society that wants to devalue them? And how do they contribute as active producers in the face of change and, and not see that the only way to do that is to get a job that pays you a lot of money? Otherwise, we dismiss three-fifths of our students and no teacher should and want to do that. So when we get this rhetoric uh, from the politicians and stuff, it sounds like mom and apple pie, right? I mean, I was on a conversation today and the guy said, well, you know, 
fairly wealthy guy says, well, you know, I sure want my four kids to get a good job, so maybe I think that's what games should be about. And I said, well, yeah, but then, but you really don't want all the other kids to get a good job because they're going to go to Walmart. So if as long as you just say it's about jobs, either change the society and have a good job for everybody or redefine what human worth is. But, um, and, and that's an exciting thing because the ability, if a kid comes out as a producer, a maker, facile with technology to use it, not to just let it be used, and able to get into learning coalitions with other people, that person can get dignity uh, and control outside of a market and can possibly be the wedge force for changing our unequal society. We're going to have to make that our summary for tonight, <laughs> Jim, okay. I'm sorry. No I, think I, I, I was thinking that I'm really glad you wrote the book because this face-to-face -face is really wonderful, but uh, there's a lot more if you pick up the book. So, well, thank, thank you. you. I hope so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks for having me, guys. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Um, thank let me you just so uh, much. do a quick closing, thank just to just yeah, to okay. say that um, this will this will um, be recorded and up on YouTube very quickly, and then um, and on Google Plus you can find it, um, and. Um, It'll eventually, within about a week, be up at edtechtalk.com, um, and you will also be able to find it at teachersteachingteachers.org. Um, and we always thank here at the end Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier, who started this network, um, the uh, edtechtalk.com channel of the World Bridges Network. We want to thank you all for showing up here tonight. Um, next week, we're going to be talking to some folks from Guru, gurulearning.org. And the week after that, we're going to pick up the conversation about uh, raising teacher voice again. And I think it really fits well with this notion of storied truths, Good. maybe storied possibilities, too. Yes, That's great. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So come back any Wednesday. And thank you all for coming tonight. And we'll see you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, you so Thank much. you so much, Jim. Bye. Thank you. That was great. Good night.